All right, so for this example, the fourth example in chapter seven, when we first look at the picture, it kind of looks like a chapter six problem where we have an object going around in circles. We know that uh, the forces acting on it are tension and gravity. We've been drawing pictures about these kinds of situations, the mass at the bottom of a loop or the mass at the top, all throughout chapter six. Now, for this example here in chapter seven, we're actually going to do a problem that we could not otherwise have done back in chapter six, where we're dealing with the fact that gravity will actually slow this thing down and it can't move at a constant speed throughout that circle, something that we didn't talk about in detail in chapter six because we wouldn't have had the math to be able to do it. So for this example, we have that the, um, the two kilogram mass is going around at the end, end of a 1.2 meter long string. Now that 1.2 meter long string, if we look at the picture, is the radius of the circle from back in chapter six. But when we try to think about the picture that we're gonna draw, what we'll recognize is that that's telling us something about the difference in height, but the difference will not just be the 1.2. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start drawing the situation. Okay, so we have this mass at the bottom of the circle and its initial speed, we're told, is nine meters per second. And it makes it all the way around the circle to the top later in the problem. And so our goal is to find the final speed. The note here on the slide that gravity is down is just to remind us that it's a vertical circle. Now, when we think about the beginning of the problem, that's our before, And when we think about the end of the problem, our after, that's here at the top of the picture. Now a couple of key things. First of all, the overall height difference between before and after, that height difference is not just the 1.2 from the center out, but it's twice that, it's the diameter of the circle or 2.4 meters. All right, so just like with all of our examples, we're gonna make that um, before and after um, picture, or not picture, but a uh, little chart. So before and after. So we ask ourselves, is the object moving? That's what the kinetic energy question is all about. And at the beginning of the problem, we know it's moving because we're given a number value for that. So one half mv initial squared. For the end of the problem, we know it's moving because that's the thing we're being asked to find. These questions that we're asking ourselves should never be, um, be ones that we're unsure about. We are either given a speed or we're being asked to find it. There's no kind of gray area confusion on whether or not we are moving in the problem if we are thinking about the big picture. All right, the other type of energy that we have so far is the potential energy of gravity. And so that question that we've been asking ourselves are, are we higher than we are at other points in the problem? At the before picture at the bottom of our circle, it doesn't matter whether we're on the ground or not. At the before picture, we are the lowest point in the problem. We are not higher than we will be later in the problem. In the after picture, we are higher up than we were, and so we're white. we will write MGH. Then separate from before, after, and as I've been saying in the previous problems, uh, we will soon get to the point where we are asking additional questions, like about springs, but there's no springs here. After we've done the before and after, the separate question that we have for ourselves is, is there a work term? Now, that work term, when we're looking for it, what we are looking for is an external force that we have not already dealt with. If we think about at some point in the circle, at any point throughout the motion, the two forces acting on this um, block are going to be tension towards the center, and gravity straight down. 
this angled kind of halfway through before and after picture here, that's one that we would not have been able to handle in chapter six. But at the bottom, gravity is down, tension is up. At the top, gravity and tension are both down. The force of gravity has already been handled. That's what the potential energy of gravity term is. It will never be an additional work term because we're already dealing with it with that term. So what we're looking for are other forces that might be causing work terms. The only other force here is tension, and there's something really important to notice about that. The tension is always pointing towards the center, and the speed, the motion, at any given point in the um, picture is perpendicular to the circle. So there is always a 90 degree angle between where tension is pointing and where the mo motion is. And since work has to be force in the direction of motion, tension will not be able to contribute a work term. So if you need to rewind that and listen to it again, that's important for us. Tension will not be able to contribute a work term because it is not it does not have any component in the direction of motion. All right, so there's no work term because there's no other forces that we haven't already accounted for. So this setup so far is the same that we've been seeing in all of our problems. I'm going to raise this up um, a little bit so we can keep going. Now the um, the chart here that we've made is so that we can easily plug things in to this uh, tool that we always use, energy before, plus work added, equals energy after. And hopefully as you, as you watch all of these videos, you see very clearly this um, this trend of what things we do in every single example. Those are the things that you should be doing in every single example that you do on your own as well. Okay, so for the energy before, we have one half mv initial squared plus zero. For the work term, when we decide that there is no work, we can just add zero. And for energy after, there are two terms. We have one half m v final squared plus m g h. So now we can plug in our numbers, and I'm going to switch to purple for all of it. We can plug in our numbers here. We have one half, it's a two kilogram block, initial is nine, that's squared, plus zero, plus zero, that goes away. Then we have one half times two times the final velocity squared plus 2 times 9.8 times 2.4. Because remember, the full height is that 2.4. So you'll notice that in, in a lot of our examples, we are making our math a little bit easy so that we can put it on the uh, whiteboard and using um, 2 kilograms so that it tends to cancel out with the 1 half here. No matter what the mass is, the steps are always going to be the same. So we don't want to get in the habit of plugging in two if we read the problem too quickly just because it keeps showing up in our examples. So just be aware of that. So one half times two times nine squared is 81. One half times two is just one, but we still have the V final squared. And then two times 9.8 times 2.4 is 47.0. So we'll subtract 47 from both sides. So 81 minus 47 is 34. So we have 34 is equal to V final squared. But what that means is we have to take the square root of both sides. So the square root of 34, V final is the square root of 34, which is 5.8 meters per second. So we can double check that it makes sense to us. So for the problem that we have here, this is now the full picture, we have that we were moving quickly at the bottom, and because we're trying to fight gravity as we go up to the top, we should be moving a little bit slower. So that 5.8 meters per second, that fits our kind of quick common sense check. 
And we can make sure that we understand that too by realizing that if all of our energy was in one term at the beginning and we have to split it up into two terms at the end, then that's another way that we can quickly make sure we understand that the speed has to be a little bit slower. We have less energy in that kinetic term. All right, I'll see you in the next one.